shaman rituals. I remember um, my parents taught me how to hold the chicken, kill it, and like clean it and everything. So I don't look like I know how to gut a chicken, but I promise I do. <laughs> and my mom was always asking me to help her. So definitely grew up in that type of household, um, you know, washing dishes, doing chores. And so that's my belief. But then I also um, lived around my neighbors who brought us to church events during Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, and so we were also introduced to Christianity. And then later in my life, uh, when I was living in San Francisco, I stumbled upon Buddhism. And that's kind of been the path that I've been taking lately, and the journey has just been very similar to shamanism, where we believe in a lot of spirits and souls, and leading a life of, you know, purity. And it's, it's very simple. So religions, I think, you know, we all miss the mark when we're fighting about, oh, who's right, who's God is uh, the one that's leading us. And I think the one universal thing we all have in common for religion is just be a good person, right? When it comes down to the core of it, just, you don't know what's at the end of life, and you don't want to end up in the wrong place, right? So, that's my background on my beliefs. And then, I am also a graduate uh, therapy student, so I'm still learning, and so hereditary trauma is something that I randomly stumbled upon when I was going through my own therapy and unfolding my journey and learning about how trauma is passed through our body and we pass it on to our teens, or our, to our kids. So today, uh, I wanna to talk about trauma and the body, and you can't really talk about trauma without talking about the body, because there is scientific facts and research that shows that your body carries trauma and you pass it down. So when we talk about trauma, we're talking about a very powerful emotion or a physical experience that leaves a very lasting impression on people. So the mind and body are closely connected and that means that what affects one affects the other. And a lot of times we don't think that, okay, um, a physical injury is going to cause a mental uh, impression on us. But if you think about it, let's say you somebody cuts their leg, right? You can, if you think about that cut, you can still feel that pain, even though that cut is no longer there. So it's closely interconnected, even though we don't really see that all the time. Uh, so these are just, um, you know, examples of physical symptoms of untreated trauma. Chronic pain, I don't know about you, but my dad constantly com complains about pain everywhere throughout his body. Every day he's in pain somewhere. And, you know, that's caused by stiffness in the neck, your back, and that's also uh, sometimes trauma, oh, as we uncover more, um, trauma that has been unresolved. And then digestive issues. Uh, I know plenty of other mom folks who have stomach ulcers, and it's not just because you eat spicy food, right? It's because of other things that manifested throughout your life, such as um, untreated anxiety, depression, uh, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and it leads to all these other physical ailments. There's also cardiovascular problems, so with the heart, um, high blood pressure again, that's something um, where our body is not balanced, right? And so we have to regulate it somehow. And then weakened immune system. So also, you know, when you're not mentally well in mom shaman culture, we believe that your soul is lost, right? If you're having, um, if you're sick or weak, uh, and in therapy, it's basically your body is carrying some kind of mental or emotional fatigue. So understanding the mind-body connection helps us see that healing is not just about one aspect of ourselves, but about treating the whole person, so their mind and body together. In therapy, this is called a somatic experience, so feeling your body and connecting it with your thoughts. So what is the mind-body connection? This is the way our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions can influence our physical health and vice versa. For example, when you're nervous or stressed, you might notice that your heart beats faster or your muscles tense up. And this is your mind and body interacting. So, you know, you could think of a time when you were nervous, right? What was happening? You are probably sweating and you feel heat throughout your body, right? And you're shaky, your body, and it's, it's 
very hard to control. So trauma can disrupt the natural balance between the mind and body. When someone experiences trauma, it can trigger strong emotions like fear, anger, or sadness. And these emotions just don't stay in the mind. They affect the body as well. The impacts of trauma. Trauma can be both physical and emotional. So examples of physical impact, like I said earlier, is muscle tension, so causing stiff neck, shoulders, and back, uh, digestive issues, leading to stomach aches, irritable bowel syndrome, and then heart problems, immune system, again. And then the emotional impact, that can lead to anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, and you know, all of these are, um, it's symptoms that are caused by something deeper, right? And I think escaping from, as refugees from Laos, Thailand, and during the Vietnam War, a lot of our parents and grandparents and family life, they never talked about this. Um, my parents still have a hard time talking about escaping war and becoming refugees, you know, and coming here. And so it's still very hard, and when they do begin to talk about it, they either get very triggered, um, they shut down, or they get very sad, and that's literally your body reacting to a memory that happened so long ago. So you can kind of see the mind-body connection there. Uh, the legacy of trauma in the Hmong community. Uh, we were, you know, in war and conflict. I think all of us understand and remember the history of what the Hmong have. We've only been in the U.S. for about 50 years, so the history is still very close to us. And many Hmong people have this shared history of trauma because they played a crucial role during the Civil War in Laos and assisting the U.S. military during the Vietnam War. So after the war, many Hmong were targeted by the new communist government in Laos, which led to persecution, displacement, and refugee status. This history of war and displacement contributed to significant trauma among the Hmong population, and there have been studies done on Holocaust survivors and also slave uh, ancestors of slaves, right? And they have seen significant um, <coughs> increases of di physical diseases in these populations, and there's a scientific connection between the two of uh, Holocaust survivors having higher anxiety, depression, compared to people who have not had this type of um, history. So what is trauma or hereditary trauma? Hereditary trauma means that the stress and trauma experienced by one generation can affect the next. And what happens through, uh, it happens through very different ways. So epigenetics, it changes, an example is like a light switch for your genes, right? So if you imagine your genes, um, they're like a big instruction book that tells your body how to work, what to do, um, and what colors your eyes should be, your hair, how tall you are, and all of that is carried in our DNA. In epigenetics, it's the sticky note that you put on the instruction book to remind you which parts to read or skip. And so when something happens to you, like uh, you're very stressed out or you have a lot of depression or sadness in your body and you don't deal with it or acknowledge it and allow it to work through, um, it turns into it's, it's like adding or removing a sticky note. So it's like if you were reading your book and you say, I'm gonna come back to this, that's kind of what your genes are saying. And so when you're stressed or you're um, anxious, it skips over that and it's like, I don't need to do this right now, I'm gonna remove that. Like, that's not important. Your body is trying to work as efficiently as it can to keep you alive. And that's its sole purpose, right? Our body is there to give us function and life, and that's exactly what our brain does as well. So even though you have the same book, uh, the way it's read is going to change depending on your environment and what is happening to you at the time. So you can only imagine during high stress time of war, our bodies are literally functioning to survive. It's, it needs food, water, and it needs to sleep. And that's all it's thinking about, right, if you're trying to escape war. Um, and that's a big reason why scientists study epigenetics. They want to understand the things we go through and how they affect our health and even the health of future generations. In terms of behavioral transmission, 
Um, this is more of how you raise your kids, right? And so my parents, they believe in uh, spanking their kids and also um, yelling at us, right? And so I grew up with parents who loved us so much that they wanted to keep us away from harm. And it makes sense. And so their solution was to yell at us if we were to get into any kind of danger. And um, so that creates, you know, heightened anxiety and behaviors that shape our experiences. And so it also causes emotional withdrawal. And, you know, for a period of my life, I was questioning why my parents were so mean to me and all of that. I didn't understand that they loved me, right? For me, it felt like, okay, they're just yelling at me because that's who they are. But no, really, they just care about me so much that that's the only thing they could think of. Uh, so, children raised in these types of settings, uh, in science, or in therapy, it's called complex PTSD. And so, it is all these complexities of being a minority, of assimilating here in the U.S. while trying to maintain our cultural uh, identity, right? So, it's very hard, and that's why I think being long is so unique, because we don't have that history of, oh, um, we are from China, and we understand this, and we move as a unit, because of this. We don't have a whole base to refer to our history to. So behavioral transmission, again, uh, learned behaviors into adulthood. The effects of hereditary trauma. So there are many things that can come out of hereditary trauma, uh, health, mental health issues, intergenerational transmission, cultural disconnect, physical health impacts, and hereditary trauma among long individuals manifest in various different ways which affect all of these issues. Uh, mental health, it's a direct result of the trauma experienced during the wars and the difficult journey to resettle in a new country. Intergenerational transmission, it's an example of this would be parents who have untreated trauma. Uh, my, I was talking to my dad earlier and my grandfather committed suicide in Laos. And so to me, that's an indicator of depression, right? And I wanna understand, um, and I can see it in my dad as well. Um, so if you have ever been irritable, that's also, a, I'm not diagnosing anyone, but uh, irritability is also a symptom of depression. And before I used to think I was just a very angry person, or I was annoyed at everyone. I, but it turns out I actually was, I got diagnosed with depression, and it makes a lot of sense now. And so when I am irritable, I just have to remind myself, like, it's okay, these people are not annoying. You know, it's, it's me. <laughs> the problem is me. Uh, so I have to acknowledge that. And then cultural disconnect, right? <laughs> that is displacement, uh, which contributes to the ongoing stress and trauma experienced by subsequent or generations that come after as they navigate between their traditional home culture and the demands of the, the new home country. Physical impact, uh, as discussed before, stress and trauma experienced by Hmong refugees can lead to physical health problems, um, as discussed. So how do we begin addressing uh, trauma in the Hmong community, right? I mean, it begins like here, where you're open and talking and sharing experiences because when you hear somebody's story, that begins to <coughs> shed a light on your own personal journey and you start saying, hey, that sounds like something I'm going through. And when I started explaining the symptoms of depression to my dad, he was saying, oh, I, didn't, I don't know, there's no word for that, but I've experienced those. And he said, and it's not just that, right? There's so many other things and I don't know how to say irritable in mom and I can't just say, you're, you're just grouchy, you know, you're just mean. I can't say that because that doesn't translate directly. And so I want to work with small people and to come up with um, ways to talk about our symptoms. And I think this is how you begin to set that path forward. So we also want to have trauma-informed care. We want to have representation in the mental health field. We want to have those people who look like us, who understand our experience, come in and um, listen to it, right? Because it's so hard. I had white therapists, right? And I currently have a white therapist, but I, I sought an Asian therapist because I thought that they would um, have that connection and see, um, I wouldn't have to explain it as 
we would love to see a therapist, but we're afraid they're going to report our, our experiences. And we're, we're minors, and you know, you do, as a therapist for minors, you do have to report that there's abuse, right? And so that can be scary. And so having somebody who looks like you with that shared experience um, is very crucial. So if you are pursuing therapy, or you want to, or you think about or you're thinking about it, or even any sort of healing modalities, I say go for it. So, and then also cultural preservation. Um, I love being home. I, even though my home is not the best, I am so, uh, I guess I would say patriotic of being mom. Everywhere I go, I love telling people who mom people are. Uh, I love educating them about our history. And it's so unique because people, uh, if you go outside of Minnesota, uh, people always ask, what is mom? What are you, like Mongolian? And then it turns into this whole conversation and they get to know not just you, but your people and they have a better understanding. And I think that's where um, the cultural competence comes in. And a little bit of uh, personal history. So I got to go visit Cat Cat Village in Sakwa and it is beautiful. I highly recommend if you have the opportunity ever. It's, I've never been to Laos when I was born in the US, so going here, felt like I was able to be taken back into time and see uh, how long people live, right? And they still grew their rice patties, and my friends, they're with me, so they took me here, I didn't even know. And they, they're they like, that's so cool. Like, the Hmong people, you guys are so proud of your cultural heritage that you keep, you know, so many aspects of it. And the Hmong people, they're, they're so advanced. They have Wi-Fi throughout the city for free. <laughs> I was so surprised. I was like, you guys live in these kinds of homes where you have Wi-Fi, and everyone's on their phone. So it's so interesting. And these little girls, they're so cute. Um, they are, these, I think they're going to grow up. If they have the opportunity, they could be the best businesswoman in the world. Because um, as soon as you hand them some kind of money, all of them come. <laughs> and they're so cute that you can't deny it. And I'm just like, OK. I have to get a photo then. <laughs> and again, um, just more photos. And then strategies for healing. So given our historical context, there are several factors that could lead uh, or influence Hmong individuals to seek help. And that is, some of these things could be, you know, cultural stigma. A lot of, like I said, a lot of Hmong people come from different backgrounds where discussing mental health is kind of taboo. Um, if you say, oh, I'm feeling, you know, not the best, and people will tell you, oh, just feel better, like, just do better. And how do you do that when you're in this state where all you can think about is, you know, um, I don't have money for groceries. How am I going to feed my kids, right? And that's Maslow's, if you guys have heard or look into Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's what do you need to feel safe, right? And that's shelter, food, and security. And so when those things are not balanced in your life, that's all your mind can go into. And so that can spiral into depression, anxiety, and cause other sorts of um, illnesses to manifest, physical and mental. Language barriers. Again, language is so tough, especially in long. Um, you can't, there, I don't, I don't personally know if there's a word for schizophrenia, bipolar, ADHD, or any of these uh, mental health issues. So I don't even know how to begin to discuss this with my family. And I learned um, that I have ADHD, I got tested for it, and the doctor was like, yeah, you have it. And I was like, okay, what if my parents have it then? Because it's genetics. And so, we're both of them. So, uh, I can't even translate um, ADHD to my parents and let them know, like, maybe if we get tested. Not that they would want to, but um, it, it would help make a lot of sense. It puts a lot of things into perspective. And for a long time, I thought I was just a big procrastinator. I thought I was just somebody who drops the ball a lot on everything. And it turns out I just needed to understand how my brain works so I can put systems in place to show up for myself and be better. So language barriers, um, if you are a mom expert, I would love to chat with you to learn more about how you can discuss mental health and have it, um, the general population understand this more. So it becomes more normal conversations in the home. Um, 
um, despite these challenges, there are efforts to increase representation and cultural competence in mental health services for Hmong communities. So again, advocating for mental health services and healing, right? I, again, I said uh, Buddhism is a big part of my life, and that is also something that's healing. And I learned that through non-Hmong teachers. So we want to break this cycle of trauma and its impact on the body and mind. So understanding the mind-body connection is the first step to breaking these cycles. So when you're feeling nervous or anxious, again, maybe try that box breathing, right? Just to help relax. And it doesn't take long. You don't have to sit there for 30 minutes. You don't have to um, let your mind just blank out because if you have a blank mind, that means you're pretty much dead. Your brain is literally set to have thoughts. That's what it's, it does. And so some of these things, therapy, mindfulness, and meditation. Um, again, that's not sitting there and thinking home. Uh, it's more about being fully present in the moment and feeling your body sensation. So get back to that, uh, how your body felt when you were stopped breathing, right? That stillness. And then how does it feel when you're breathing in all that oxygen? And how does it feel when you're breathing it out? And then a healthy lifestyle. That's not just eating well, right? But that's exercising. And exercising can look different for everybody. We all have different bodies that have different needs. So going out for 30 minutes minimum of movement is very healthy for your body. And you want to be able to keep that up because who wants to be aching when they're 60, right? And you can't play with your grandkids. My parents constantly talk about that. Um, and then social support. I think it's very important to build community around people you can trust and feel safe because it's when you start opening up, it's very scary, right? And if it's embarrassing sometimes if it's not a normal thing, right? How do you tell somebody, oh, I have depression? Then they start judging you or they feel sorry for you and you just want people to accept you for who you are because despite having ADHD, depression, and anxiety, I still am who I am. And I just know who I am now because of all that. And it's, it's been an eye opener. So in conclusion, uh, currently there are plenty of scientific and evidence research suggesting that trauma's impact extends beyond the, the individual. So it affects our entire family and our community through both biological and behavioral pathways. So to address these effects, a comprehensive approach is needed. And so, again, I want you to be trauma-informed. Um, you know, start, if you are comfortable with it, start talking about it, maybe uh, share your experience, right? And cultural reconnection. I think it's so amazing that I, I grew up shaman and I still believe in it. And it's when I share a piece of that with my white colleagues or friends, they're so intrigued. They're like, do you see spirit? Like, no, I don't. But, you know, so I know plenty of people. I had a grandma who was a uh, uh, cleaning, and she did amazing. And you know, my family would always invite her over, and we treated her with so much respect. And everyone adored her. And then community support. Again, just tapping into that community aspect of, hey, we're all moms, so we have that in common. And I think the moms are so unique because we love each other so much in the grand scheme of things, right? Uh, we have so much love for each other, and we, when something happens to our community, I think it impacts all of us because we are, we still have that um, collective mindset. And that's it.
very notable in the community, right? Um, as refugees, as immigrants, a lot of these horrific events transmit into trauma, essentially, uh, and trauma looks different. It can present differently, especially across cultures. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I thank you so much. And um, yeah, I definitely think, you know, trauma manifests in different many ways and it, it comes and shows up in many different ways, right? If you think about um, cancer, right? Not everyone has the same symptoms of cancer. Some have hair loss because of um, chemotherapy. Some don't even need chemotherapy, right? So it looks different. And when someone shares their experience, it may not sound the same, but it carries the same weight in the body. So anxiety, <coughs> depression, it all looks different on a person. And like earlier, you know, when we're talking about feng shui, we have to think about the individual because you're not just treating the disease itself, you're treating the person, right? And we have to remember that we want to treat the person, not on um, because they have depression or they have signs of, you know, bipolar. It's again, it's not who they are. It's just a part of them, and understanding that is beginning to treat the person holistically. Hey, um, I love everything you were saying. Um, so, do you have anyone that you would recommend, like if someone would would like to like get tested for ADHD or something like that, um, who is uh, culturally uh, informed? Uh, so ADHD testing it would be through a psychologist, and it's the same standard testing. Right. So you, uh, I don't know translation wise, maybe that's what you're asking, but um, I went through a white doctor, um, and it's a test. They it's very formal. So it's based on numbers, and it's it's not it's going to give you like okay you score this much, and so this is the type of ADHD you have. So if you think you are displaying it and you want to see a psychologist, you, you can. But a therapist will not um, diagnose you with ADHD. It'll have to be through um, a psychiatrist. Laura, right, we want questions. Because um, we know trauma has been a big impact in, within the Hmong community. Uh, even myself, I think I grew up with trauma because I'm a child of a uh, refugee, immigrant, and veteran. And I think it, like scientifically proven that it's hered hereditary. And I feel that it creeps up on me. And I think growing up, I it's been a, a big impact in my life growing up. Uh, socializing or even just uh, critically thinking um, and I'm sensitive when it uh, comes to certain things that happen in the TV or movies primarily war because when, when when you watch war then it you, you have all these flux of uh, emotional um, you know, just very, very hard emotional uh, attack on you because your parents went through it, and I think it's you, you still feel that sensation or that, that emotion from them carrying to you. And I just feel very uh, sensitive to some of those aspects. But how within the Hmong community, how does uh, elders deal with uh, trauma like this, and how we? Uh, I don't know if there's any. Uh, research con conducted uh, regarding like um, helping elders in re this regard. Yeah, thank you so much. I think it's so important to address our elders because they're the ones that have, were affected the most through all this, and they carry a lot of trauma. I think it's all, it's very hard again because there is not a direct translation of mental health uh, illnesses and mental health related issues. So. Um, I think there are many therapists out there that are mom who know how to speak impeccable mom, and I think they would be the best resources. But also, there are so many resources now. Uh, NAMI, the organization, nonprofit uh, mental health organization, they just started um, 
creating long teams to advocate, especially within the uh, Minnesota area because of how populated and, or how dense the population of all people are. But to address your concern about, you know, triggers, I think that's something that's very common in a lot of Hmong communities because when not only did we escape from war, but we had to come here and my parents in Mercer, California, it was, um, the, they put the minorities together, right? So it was black community and the Hmong community and there was a lot of uh, disagreements and fights and that's why gangs became a thing, right? Because you had to build your, your community to protect each other. And so I think um, these different communities, we have to remember, we are, uh, you know, an accumulation of different learned behaviors and thoughts. And so the, the cultural competence has to come in. We have to reach out with open minds and see how other people are experiencing life. And so we all have different lenses that we're looking through. And I think remembering these triggers, it, it's a thought, right? And so when you are feeling triggered, um, I think that box breathing exercise would come in really handy. And so you want to tap into your body. What does it say? In that moment, your body is reacting to that thought. And if the more you become aware of it, the better you can have a handle of it. Um, so next time, take a, uh, you know, a closer look at the presentation that's coming up. If uh, war movies trigger you, what is your body telling you? Is it feeling heated? So maybe that can be your body reacting anxiously. Or if it, if it feels heavy, then that could be your body reacting in a very sad way and you're, you're feeling that um, grief and loss. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I really appreciate your uh, healing strategies. I'm actually um, put some of those strategies, have been medicine little strategies into my daily living. But my question to you is, um, how long is how long is the healing process, right? And how do you know when you're healed? Uh, so I guess it's a really two part question. It's how do you know when you healed, and what happens after healing? Thank you for asking that. I think it's so important, right? Because healing is a journey. It's not a destination. There's not one day you're going to wake up and everything is sunshine and rainbows. I think we're always bombarded by just life. Um, when something happens, we react as humans, and that's just our brain reacting to the situation and circumstances around us. Um, I think we have come a long way um, with modern technology, and again, our brain is a mechanism used to protect us, and so there is no concrete answer of when you're healed. I think that's a very personal experience, and so it depends on the person, uh, you know, for me, I, when I started therapy and started meditating, it, I meditated in 2019, and the first year, I thought it was over. Nothing was happening. Nothing was changing. I was still, you know, my mind was still as loud as ever. There was so much chatter, and I just kept going. I just kept showing up for myself because I didn't know what healing looks like, right? And healing or being healed looks different. And so after therapy and working with meditation teachers and coaches, uh, healing for me looks like showing up for myself, uh, staying committed to what I say I'm going to do, and being consistent. And so a lot of that was being able to understand how my life works um, and saying, this is what I have, this is who I am, and understanding your basis. Uh, so for me, again, depression, anxiety, ADHD, how do I incorporate those things and understand it into my life so I can have a better rest? And before I used to be so disorganized, I would, I probably would have, if this was last year, I probably would have just not showed up because of how unorganized I was. And now, because I've been showing up for myself, staying consistent, and understanding, that's the core part of it. So the educational part, being aware is really the first step to say, okay, this is my baseline, and I'm going to start from here. And then just committing to that healing journey, because again, it's not a destination. You're going to be uncovering different things throughout your life as you move on through different chapters, right? It's, if you're staying stagnant, that's also something that you're going to eventually have to fight. Did I answer your question? I know it's... You know, um, I've been really struggling with healing, right? And uh, for me, I don't know about everybody else, but healing is the process process, the returning process. And from my what I understand of the body, 
appreciation for those who can afford for those. And then, you know, maybe it's a two-part question. Some are afraid to even go to a mental health therapist or any therapist or counselor because of that stigma. Um, what would you um, recommend? Yeah, uh, so the first part of your question, I think, you know, cost is a big